This presentation is about emulating the world's fastest learners and trying to decipher the recipe, if there is one, that they share in common. And in fact, at least from what I've seen, it is possible by emulating these people to become world class in almost any skill. And by world class, I mean top 5% in the general population in six to 12 months. And that sounds ridiculous. So it's, it is possible to do some pretty impressive things by embracing what I call in this case, the four-hour ethos. And this is an optimal minimalism. Hold in mind one skill that you would like to acquire or that perhaps you've given up on, whether that's learning to play the guitar, learning to speak another language like Spanish, could be anything. The method that I have arrived at after 15, 20 years of testing, looking for a method, a framework that could be applied to everything from language learning to sports is this, up here, DIS. And it's an acronym the exception of I, and we'll go through each in turn. The first step is deconstruction. Deconstruction means taking something very, very large and breaking it down into smaller pieces. It also means identifying why you might fail before you start. What are the reasons that you've quit? What are the reasons other people have failed? And the goal, we'll look at swimming, the goal is to avoid those problems for at least the first five sessions. That's it. And this is based on Nike Plus data. Once you log your data, or just practice in this case, for five sessions, they can be very short, you can establish that as a habit. That's your goal. Avoid these failure points for the first five sessions. The next is selection. And selection is, in effect, the 80-20 principle, or Pareto's law, where you're trying to identify the 20% or fewer of activities, tools, et cetera, that produce 80% or more of the results. And you can, you can determine this pretty easily. There's a lot of research looking at different fields, searching for exactly this. The Axis of Awesome, some of you may know. The awesomest band in Australia, perhaps. If you've ever wanted to learn to play the guitar, as I had for a very, very long time, found it intimidating for whatever number of reasons, the Axis of Awesome has a video online you can find on YouTube very easily, where they use four or five chords to play almost every pop song you've ever heard all of the most popular pop songs you can imagine, and they play them with four or five chords. That is an example of minimalism. Another example of minim minimalism would be language learning. So to become really functionally fluent in almost any language, you really only need 1,200 to 2,000 words to express any concept and to understand most concepts communicated to you. This is Cardinal Mezzofanti, Giuseppe Mezzofanti, born 1774, and he, he was an incredible guy. Uh, one of the most famous polyglots in the world. He'd been tested in 29 languages, fluent in 29, and was purported to speak as many as 72. How did he do it? You can't exactly go to Amazon.com in 1774 and buy materials. He did it by using the Lord's Prayer. He had the Lord's Prayer, and that to him in one page encapsulated all the fundamental grammar in any language, and he would have native speakers simply translate that for him. And I took a very similar approach with languages in these 12 or 13 sentences. I've applied this to Spanish, to German, to Gaelic, and I don't necessarily recall and retain all these languages, but I have done it with four or five that I've wanted to pursue to fluency. This encapsulates all the most important grammar. Is it subject, object, verb, subject, verb, object, indirect object, treatments, and so on. And you can, uh, you can completely deconstruct and, uh, and select, in effect, the grammar of a given language in, let's say, one to two hours. Here, these are from, from, from flights with Arabic and Russian, including the Cyrillic alphabet. It's very straightforward. Keeping in mind, also, that I had actually failed, effectively, Spanish when I had to take it in junior high and high school. I'd concluded that I was bad at languages. I wasn't bad at languages. I just had a bad method. So the minimalism, the 80-20 approach, can be applied to gear as well. Uh, as it applies to cooking, and I chose cooking, by the way, to explore accelerated learning in The 4-Hour Chef because it had beaten me many times before. It's something I had quit many times. So I wanted to take that on as a challenge. You don't need an entire set of 12, 15 pots or pans to cook effectively. And in fact, when I was uh, doing research for this book, which took me from Tokyo to Silicon Valley to India and elsewhere, in the, in the best Thai restaurant in India, the executive chef uses two stainless steel skillets and a chef's knife, a Victorinox chef's knife that you could buy at Walmart for $20. That's it. You don't need a lot. 
cast iron skillet, basic knife, you're set. In terms of coffee, just for those people who might like coffee, uh, you see a number of tools here that I've used. I recommend the AeroPress, and all you need to remember is that, that you're grinding each serving, not grinding in advance, and then using water that is 180 degrees Fahrenheit or less. So that's about 82 degrees Celsius, I believe. Someone else can check that, I'm sure. And you won't ever have bitter coffee again. The next is sequencing. This is the secret sauce in a lot of ways. And the question you ask here is, what if I did things in the opposite order? What if I omitted what people tell me are best practices? And this has been applied elsewhere in manufacturing, for instance, with lean manufacturing with Toyota. This is Josh Waitzkin, one of my favorite people. Uh, Josh, if you've ever seen the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer or read the book, is the chess prodigy from that book. He's the little kid. Turns out that he has a framework. It's not that he has the inherent skills, although he's a smart guy. He has a framework that he can apply to many, many skills. And he's since, from being one of the world's best chess players, applied it to Tai Chi push hands to become national and world champion. He's applied it to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to become the first black belt under Marcelo Garcia, who's like the Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods combined in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. In the case of chess, what he did is he learned how to do it completely backwards. His first coach took him and said, rather than starting with openings that are very seductive and will lead you to memorize things, much like stealing the answers from the teacher for a math test, we're going to start with board control, which means you're going to have pawn and a king versus another pawn. And that's how we're going to play. So doing things in reverse actually can be extremely beneficial. When I was training for Argentine Tango in Argentina, this was in 2005, uh, very accidental, in fact, but I looked at a number of ways that the best people competed, what they trained, uh, what they taught explicitly versus doing in competition but not teaching, and I decided that I thought I could make more progress by learning the female role first. So instead of learning the male role first, which is a real hassle, a real pain in the ass, and very embarrassing, I decided to learn how to follow. And I trained with one of the best female dancers uh, in the world uh, to learn how to follow. And five and a half months later, as part of that, uh, was able to go to the world championships and make it to the semifinals. I'm not a tango dancer. I'm built like a monkey. Look at me. So if I can do it, I think you guys could probably do very much the same. These next two photographs are related to learning skills under pressure or not learning them under pressure. The worst time to learn how to cook or, for instance, knife skills is when you're under pressure to make a meal. It's the worst time to do it. Uh, you should actually uh, look for opportunities to practice what I call no-stakes practice. So if you look at this second photograph here, I'm learning how to saute, which means to jump in French. And I'm not doing it over the stove. I'm actually practicing the wrist motion with dry beans in a skillet. And I'm kneeling on a carpet so they don't fly everywhere on a hardwood floor. You do this for 20 minutes, Two or three times, you'll have the motion down. And then you can use two hands over the stove and you won't have any problem. No omelets on the walls. All right. The last photograph, knife skills. This is something that's very intimidating for people. And it need not be intimidating. You just need to learn when you can't cut yourself. So this is a lettuce knife. The green knife is a lettuce knife. Has the same form factor as the chef's knife next to it. So all you have to do is learn how to hold the knife properly, which you see here and then practice while you're watching Game of Thrones or whatever the hell you might be watching on TV <laughs> and just cut celery. Just get used to cutting celery. Again, do that for 20 minutes, two or three times, you'll be comfortable with a knife. And then you can use the stuff that can stab people. But start with the no stakes approach. Speaking of stakes, this doesn't mean steak, i.e. piece of cow. It means steak, like vampire, steak through the heart steak, or consequences. If you don't stick to your diet, what happens? You just stay the way that you've been. You don't get fired from your diet. You don't have someone chastise you necessarily about it. Of course, in your job, you do get fired if you don't do something. And you, therefore, are inclined to do it. You have an incentive. Uh, it is extremely, extremely effective to build incentives into whatever behavioral change you want in your life, to whatever skills you want to acquire. This is AJ Jacobs. AJ Jacobs is a human guinea pig, much like me. And uh, in this particular photo, or set of photographs, uh, he decided for a year to try to follow all of the rules in the Old and New Testament, which is extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. He lives in New York City. So the after photo that you see with 
with the beard there is when he was dressed in full white robes and had his beard grown out. And he did everything. In fact, uh, when he had to stone adulterers, plays a pretty big part in the Bible, he was, uh, he was at a bit of a quandary because he didn't want to get arrested or just feel guilty or just kill anyone by stoning them. And he realized they didn't specify the size of the stones. So he got a pocket full of pebbles, little tiny pebbles, and he went to Central Park asking people if they were adulterers, and then he would you know, flick one at them and run away. <laughs> so, check. And uh, AJ, following this, this is a great book called The Year, the Year of Living Biblically. It's a wonderful book. Uh, decided he wanted to get in shape. And he had never been in shape. He had what he described as a, a python that swallowed a goat physique, which he was not happy with. And he didn't need a new special trainer. He didn't need a secret technique from the former Soviet Union. He needed motivation. So AJ is Jewish, and he wrote a check to the KKK for $1,000 and gave it to one of his friends and said, if I don't lose X number of pounds, 30 pounds, by Y point in time, I want you to mail this to the KKK. That's an incentive. <laughs> Money is a great incentive, as all of you know. And you don't have to do what he did. Uh, you can use a tool like stick.com. I have no affiliation with them, I'm just a fan. Uh, stick.com came out of research done by a professor at Yale. It was initially called the Commitment Store. What do you do? You set your goal. I want to follow ABC diet. Next, you set your stakes. So I'm going to take 1% of my pre-tax income and put it into escrow as my stakes, my motivation. 